Have you ever wondered what your dreams mean? Join us in Dream School at thisjunginlife.com and find out. Jung wrote, Dreams are a little hidden door in the innermost and most secret recesses of the soul. Dream School is a unique, self-paced online program you can start at any time that unlocks access to your inner world. Our 12-month program provides the support, knowledge, and guidance you need to reach within, decipher your personal dream code, and harness it to optimize your life. By enrolling, you'll join an affirming community of fellow travelers, each pursuing a unique quest. And it's fun. Join us on an adventure to wholeness and healing through understanding your dreams. Go to thisjungianlife.com and click on Dream School. You'll be taken to our secure checkout. Once you join, you'll get immediate access to our first three modules. You can get started right away. We look forward to seeing you there. Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today, we are going to talk about a difficult subject, but certainly it's something that's very much a, a factor in the world for friends and families and that is suicide. Um, So we will try to do what we always do and to circumambulate it and talk about uh, some of the factors that contribute to this and its effect on other people in that person's life. And I would particularly like to say that Brian, who is a listener and wrote in so thoughtfully, um, this is very much in response to your request. Suicide is a uniquely human trouble. Mm -hmm. It it would be shocking to us to think of an animal committing suicide, a gazelle or a lion committing suicide. The, The drive to stay alive in the body is part of the primal push inside of us and, and it is a great distressing mystery that for some of us, a block builds up between that thirst for life and more life. And then suicide begins to feel like a viable behavioral option. Yeah. And I, th- I think even just backing up a little from that, Joseph, I mean, has there ever been a person who hasn't had a thought I mean, I think that, that having the thought, it would be so much easier if I were just, if I could just die or something, or, you know, I, I wish I weren't alive right now. I think that is an almost universal thought, very different from an intention to suicide or coming up with a plan or taking any action. But I think it's something almost everyone can relate to having had that thought at some time or another, where it just feels like it would be easier if we could cease to exist. I think at the level of fantasy, yes, I think that is true. That when we are facing either a current excruciating pain or we are fearing that we are moving towards a horrible, painful experience, that the fantasy of um, dissolving to escape, I I think, is very powerful. Yeah, Yeah, very much. That's uh, such an important uh, word, I think, that you just used, Joseph, of the escape, of the feeling that I can't deal with this or I won't be able to deal with this. Or, or I don't, I don't want to have to deal with this. And, uh, that this is the place that will spring me free of some sort of seemingly overwhelming life conflict 
or inner conflict or all of the above. That's something that is so overwhelming to the ego that the person feels he or she will not be able to survive it anyway. That it's that overwhelming, that difficult, and that hopeless. I think one of the things that comes up for me here is that, as you put it, Joseph, sometimes the the wish for escape comes upon us when we are facing something that feels overwhelming or that we know is going to demand of us that we make a sacrifice we don't want to have to make. We're going to have to give up a part of ourselves that we cherish, for example. And so suicide can often come up as a fantasy in moments of real uh, transformation. And I've seen it in my practice numerous times where someone has a suicide fantasy You know, it's difficult as a therapist when you have a client who's speaking of suicide. I think a lot of times as clinicians, that word enters the room and immediately we are on alert and we can become very activated and respond from a place of fear, which can be a terrible mistake if you over respond. Of course, it can be a terrible mistake if you under respond as well, which is one of the things that makes it so fraught. But when I'm fairly certain that it's really coming in on the level of fantasy, I try to treat it with a kind of welcoming attitude, like let's let it in and let's talk about it. Let's let it be here. What is the fantasy? And if we can hold it, if we can hold the tension around it, sometimes it does resolve in that we can both appreciate, both myself and the analysis can appreciate that this is a symbolic death that needs to happen. That yes, something needs to die. There is an attitude that needs to go or an old version of yourself. And I've seen it happen where this became almost kind of ritualized with someone maybe actually writing a suicide note without them really intending to take their own life but a part of them felt the urge to write that note, uh, but that it could be held eventually as a symbolic death. I want to say that uh, I find it difficult when uh, suicidal ideation is part of the process that enters the consulting room. And I agree that it does need to be understood and explored, and that hopefully a symbolic attitude can be achieved. What does that represent in that person's fantasy? I think it represents a kind of uh, a hopelessness, and I'm, I'm in it by myself. I'm at a dead end here. And that by being in it together, especially in a process which I think is inherently uh, life-giving in the quest of individuation, some other third way uh, hopefully can be achieved. And, And with that said, I think The other part that I'm always aware of is that ultimately this is not within my purview uh, to take control of or dictate a solution. And I think that's especially hard, is the recognition that this is an other person uh, who has agency in his or her life, including the ability to end it. You know, Deb, I think that you and I are are talking around this important issue that uh, maybe Joseph originally lifted up, is that when when someone brings in suicide to the consulting room, there is this way that sometimes it's more in the realm of fantasy and what are they trying to tell us. And 
then there's this other way where it can sometimes be there's some real serious suicidal ideation going on. There's the possibility that someone could do something impulsively or this person is really planning on taking his or her life. It's so hard as a clinician to distinguish between those two levels sometimes. And it's really difficult as a clinician not to get activated with fear and kind of panic and assume you're dealing with the second thing when you really might be dealing with the first thing and to let there be a little bit of room around it if, it, if you do think it's the first thing. I mean, the stakes are obviously, they couldn't possibly be higher. So there's a real fear of making a mistake. But Debbie, you talked about the sort of despair or a kind of sense of a dead end and the way that the analytic relationship can maybe become a container for this life-giving process of individuation. I mean, this is in some sense a rather... Uh, kind of bread and butter observation, but damn, if it isn't a good one, a lot of times when people come in and say, you know, sometimes I think about killing myself, a really good place to go is just to say, I think you're trying to let me know just how much pain you're in. Because sometimes that's the real communication is, I don't know that you can quite grasp how awful I feel. But if I tell you that I'm thinking of taking my own life, then maybe you'll get it. So then the introduction is really symbolic, that the psyche is taking the pain and the suffering and capturing it in the, in the symbolic image of leaving life, abandoning life. Mm -hmm. And they're mm -hmm. trying to communicate that to us. And it can be a, a huge, uh, it can be very containing for a person who's in that place to just hear from us, um, I, gosh, I you are. I'm hearing just you are in gr a great deal of pain. You you are really really suffering. It's like ah, oh, okay, the message got heard. Another manifestation that I have seen many times is clients who will admit that they have chronically imagined suiciding over many years, and then what emerges in the discussion is that it is oddly comforting to them to continue to remind themselves that they have a choice, um, that they have an exit door, which I have not seen any of them take, but to remind themselves that they are not trapped actually salves something in them. Yes, I've, I've, I've seen that too. It brings to mind a, a personal story, which is a, is a little uh, not anywhere near as serious as the topic that we're talking about. But for, for a few years, I worked overseas. And when I would have a bad day, I mean, like something would go wrong at work, or I'd like have a falling out with a friend or just have a just have a shitty day. And I'd say to myself, God, I'm just I'm just gonna go home. I'm just gonna quit this job and go back to the States. And after catching myself doing this a number of times, I thought, what do I tell myself when I have a bad day at home? You know, but it, it served the same function that when I had a disappointment or uh, a difficulty, I, I had this immediate fantasy of escape. And I think you're right, Joseph. I think there's a way that it can possibly be adaptive. The trouble is that sometimes when you've been nursing the fantasy for a long time and you do hit a major speed bump, it's so easy to turn to that and perhaps even enact it. But it certainly doesn't always go that way. And, and then the question of resorting to any kind of a fantasy in order to cope suggests that there is an adaptation that is failing, that there is some way in which life has to be grabbed or some problem needs to be truly triumphed and that that's often being avoided by a consistent fantasy whether it's suicidality or something else but you're right Lisa that we always have to take that kind of language very very seriously we have to vet people carefully and regularly in order to discern that line between a close possible action versus a fantasy. And because I think when it's a question of 
gosh, we're just in so much pain and we don't know how else to communicate it. If you say that to someone, you know, I, 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 I wish I could die. If you get the reaction from the clinician or the friend or the family member of like, okay, uh, let me call 911, you, you don't, you still don't feel heard. You know, you've just, you just are getting the other person's panic. And maybe now you're in the position where you have to take care of that person who's panicking and you still haven't had your pain received. Building on this idea of inducing panic in the listener, there is another phenomena of announcing suicidal ideas, which is part of the projective identification process. That sometimes when a client comes in and they have a particular distortion of character, they find themselves in chronic distress. And because they are functioning in a very young psychological way, they will try to induce high levels of distress in the people around them and then unconsciously imagine that their distress is being inserted into the other person. And then when the other person is stirred up to be highly distraught, the patient becomes very, very calm. So telling somebody, you know, I'm, I'm going to commit suicide, whipping them up into a panic so that then the patient can be very warm and calm and say, oh, don't be so worried. It'll be okay. It's a very odd but familiar dynamic of shifting high levels of distress around. It's a maladaptive coping mechanism, but it's not uncommon. But it highlights the role of the clinician in containing these feelings, mm -hmm. right? It highlights, um, I think, going back to what you said, of how do we receive the pain of that person uh, who is thinking about uh, suicide? If it can be communicated in the consulting room you know, or among family members where the distress is transferred to the other person. There's a relational dynamic there that I think in and of itself uh, can be positive, hopeful, at least it can be turned toward a positive end, that there are now two people um, in this dynamic and in the dilemma. And that is a plus if it can be used uh, to really explore and understand what is going on in this person. We're ultimately talking one way or another. We're talking about feelings. And a feeling with all in capital letters that are sometimes feel like they're on fire uh, that has overtaken the other person, whether it's kind of a chronic underlying default place to go to, or whether it's uh, a moment of such acute distress um, that, that it comes upon the person suddenly to do a self-destructive act. And how do we deal with those feelings, including feelings that are caused by real mental illnesses? Mental illness is something we should pick up on more, Deb, but I want to just sort of double back to Joseph, your example about this kind of projective identification. Another thing that can drive suicidal ideation, in addition to just despair and grief, is anger. Oh, yes. And, uh, you, you know, I love Karen Marotta. And, and she says, she says, when she told me she felt like committing suicide, I asked her who she was angry with. And, and sometimes what people are angry with when they're suicidal is they're angry at their fate. They're angry at life that life has not worked out the way they wanted it to. And I think that sometimes suicidality can be sort of a way of refusing to accept one's fate. I have this great little case from this book by Jan Bauer. Jan Bauer is a Jungian analyst uh, who wrote this wonderful book called Impossible Love, Why the Heart Must Go Wrong. And she talks about this doctor who'd had his career ruined because he worked at a prison and he'd had an affair with a prisoner. And he came into her and he said, if you can't give me a reason to live in a month, I'm going to take my own life. 
wow, that's some beginning to an analysis, right? And she writes, with time, he began to accept that something needed to die and that was, and that this was already nearly accomplished. His desire to kill himself was like a last stand of ego pride before coming to the painfully disturbing realization that no one had betrayed him but himself. Mm. I think it can be a way of us kind of raising our fist and railing against our fate and saying, if you don't, if I don't get what I want, I'm just going to hold my breath. Mm -hmm. And sometimes what, what we're really being asked to do is submit. Another way that the rage can facilitate suicidality is when rage and hatred is turned relentlessly against oneself, it tends to create a very, very intense crippling form of depression. Mm, yes. And again, it doesn't feel like a kind of anger we're familiar with, but the life force can be so thwarted that it gives rise again to these fantasies of dissolving into nothingness mm -hmm. in one way or another. Sadly, statistically, men tend to take their own lives through more violent means, uh, like a gunshots. Women tend to take their lives uh, in softer means, uh, with medication pills. And one thought around that is men are more likely to redirect rage against themselves and are predisposed to commit suicide in more directly violent ways because of that. Well, I think one way or another, um, it's a turning against the self. But it has to do with these different images of destroying or dissolving but rather than being able to address the issue within or adjust, submit to, accept, or understand differently something on the external world, the person turns against himself or herself. That's the dynamic, is I can't take it out there into the world. I'm going to take it out on myself. And to the extent that you're pulling someone in, though, in this dynamic that Joseph was talking about before, you're kind of imposing your suffering on the person who's witnessing that you've now got their level of concern up and you've roped the person in. And as therapists, that can happen to us all the time. And that begs the question that we've been circling around is, as clinicians or for that matter, as family members, and people disclose to us that they're feeling suicidal, or perhaps we are connected to people who have attempted suicide several times unsuccessfully, so that their threat seems terrifyingly real, if not likely. How do we live? How do we live as the receiving person of that in this atmosphere? of uncertainty, uncertainty of the other person's behavior, uncertainty around their survival against the spirit of suicide. I think that from an archetypal level, there is something powerful about the seduction of suicide. Jung sometimes connected suicidal energy with the archetype of the Dark Mother, that when people are feeling overwhelmed by any number of dimensions of life, and they begin to constellate suicidal fantasies, and then I explore how they think this is going to feel once they've completed the suicide, they will often evoke uterine fantasies. They'll often say, oh, I won't have to do anything, that you won't have to breathe, you won't have to move, you won't have to think. And one of the pieces that sometimes we'll be able to put together is that you also have a memory of being in that state, that you, when you were in the womb, you didn't have to even breathe for yourself. You didn't have to digest your own food. You're in a constantly cushioned, temperature-controlled environment in a, a kind of mystical dream state as you were developing. And as they consider it, 
that they're being seduced back into the womb, that that's able sometimes to help them turn things around. And part of it is realizing that it is highly unlikely, if impossible, that that actually will be the experience. That they just are driven by the fantasy that it will feel like that. And that they're also being tempted by a memory because you do remember on some cellular level of what it was like to do nothing. So uh, what you're lifting up here, Joseph, is that there is a regressive urge and a kind of refusal. It takes me to the image of the hero's journey, a refusal of the call to get out into life or to really embrace and deal with what's going on in oneself. What is stopping me? What am I suffering? And how, how can I deal with that in a more life-affirming way in the sense that it serves an individuation process rather than, okay, I'll, I'll just end it all, so there. I, I want to bring in a quote from Marie-Louise von Franz where she talks about this exact thing. So this is from Shadow and Evil and Fairy Tales. She said, you see this sometimes in the case of a young man who should marry or choose a profession or who discovers that the fullness of youth is leaving him and that he has to accept the ordinary human fate. Many at that moment prefer to die either by an accident or in war rather than become old. At the critical time between 30 and 40, the tree is growing against them. Their inner development is no longer in tune with the conscious attitude, but grows against it. And in that moment, they have to suffer a kind of death. It should mean a change of attitude, but may mean actual physical death, a kind of disguised suicide, because the ego cannot give up its attitude. That is the crucial moment where they are sacrificed by a process of inner development which has turned against them. That is a very, very sobering dimension. This idea of what appears to be an accidental suicide. Mm -hmm. Jung noted this in his practice. We've mentioned this example of having a, a mountain climber come to him and in a private session who dreams of uh, dying in a mountaineering experience and then in fact does a short time after mm -hmm. that that the unconscious is beginning to turn upon the ego and upon the body. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is deeply sobering. Mm -hmm. In one of the interviews that Jung gave, he is quoted as saying, take the tendency to commit suicide right from the beginning. What happens? You don't pay attention on the street. One day you fall downstairs. Then there's a little automobile accident. It doesn't look like anything, yet these are the preliminaries. Chance? Primitive people never mention chance. That is why I say, be careful when you are not one with yourself in your moments of dissociation. Mm -hmm. And you see that. You really do. So I think what we're all saying is about suicidality in the first half of life, uh, and that there is a developmental process uh, that is somehow being negated or that can't be undertaken, or there are unconscious forces that uh, create uh, uh, sort of strange accidents, uh, but that this is, in a sense, um, not how the life spirit is supposed to develop. It's not the trajectory uh, that could lead somebody toward more development. And I'm contrasting that with uh, people in the second half of life uh, who perhaps have a terminal illness. For example, Freud made the decision to end his own life at the age of 83. Uh, he had been suffering from cancer of the mouth and jaw for years, and um, it was clearly uh, going to be terminal. And, and so he requested help from his physician who administered, I think, morphine 
So there's such a contrast between first and second halves of life and what a conscious decision versus uh, being subsumed by unconscious forces could look like. Yes, I think that suicide in the beginning of life can often look like a refusal. Mm. And suicide at the end of life or assisted suicide in the lines of the Kevorkian thoughts of being assisted out of a traumatized and, and ill body. Suicide at the end of life is more of a choice, or at least we hold it that way. As we've been circling around the problem of suicidality, I found myself thinking about the role of the intolerable, which then leads to a feeling or a certainty that ending one's life is the only recourse. And this is something that Jung suffered with at a period in his life. Um, he mentions this in Memories, Dreams, and Reflections, his autobiography on page 180. He talks about having experienced these terrible images. One of them were visions of the destruction of Europe. Another vision that he had was the death of Siegfried, who in his personal mythology represented a solar god, or the death of all things that are radiant and heroic. And while the images that I'm conveying seem really tolerable for Jung, they carried a quantity of emotional suffering that was unbearable for him. And he writes about keeping a loaded revolver in his night table for quite some time as a kind of reassurance that if he could not figure out what these things meant, that he would be willing to take his life rather than suffer the um, excruciating, unreasonable feelings that they evoked. He did finally have a dream, a series of resolutions that allowed him to both understand and to some degree metabolize these visions. But it is a poignant example of feeling that we just cannot go on after a certain point in a state of suffering. What I'm thinking about is um, the illustration of validation in, in those examples from Jung's life of how overwhelming uh, insight and suffering can be. Uh, his visions about the destruction of, of Europe were uh, really predictive of World War I. And so uh, that's an enormous uh, realization to uh, have to ask somebody to take in. But uh, his ability to make meaning of it and to seek help from the self, which we have not mentioned yet, uh, that there that there is a center deep in each of us that can come to our aid. And somehow Jung not only had that ability, but there was an ability in a way, I think, to surrender uh, and to acknowledge that this was bigger than his own ego and that he was not going to overcome it through his own ego. And Jung had access to the objective unconscious, which is not always something that people do that he could drop down into this level where the image producing function of his psyche would spontaneously work for him, which allowed him to be in dialogue with the transcendent function, with some capacity in himself to create a symbol that would allow him to, or help him to pull his life back together and to make the intolerable tolerable. You know, Deb, with you lifting up the self, we could think about suicide as a, a kind of dysfunction of the ego self axis, which is something that we've spoken about on the podcast before, the sense that you have a channel of communication between the, the self with a capital S and the ego. And Jung says uh, the goal of life is the realization of the self. If you kill yourself, you abolish that will of the self that guides you through life to that eventual goal. 
you ought to realize that suicide is murder, since after suicide there remains a corpse exactly as with any ordinary murder. There, there is a transpersonal force in each of us that wants to go somewhere. It just says, you know, to pull out the old trope about the acorn, I think every acorn wants to be an oak tree. And uh, the self has an urge to its own realization uh, that is beyond ego. And I think to some extent there is a tendency to over-identify with ego, with the I part of our personality, which is not the total self. The I part of us is one part of us. And it likes to believe that it's in charge and uh, take its own suffering very personally, which I think Jung learned not to do, uh, that there are some things that are beyond us in the way of events and happenings, and that there is a guiding self as well that has its own life trajectory. And the question is, do we have the right to interfere with that? You know, is that the healthy and life-oriented course to take? Yes, it speaks to the idea that Jung felt quite certain about is that the ego needs the self or the transpersonal, but also the transpersonal needs the ego and the body. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There is a reciprocal love affair between that which is above and that which is below, and that the archetypal realities or the spiritual realities of the self require incarnation in order to bring forth its full potential and that the universe is driven in that direction and and that when we for any number of reasons interrupt that process there is a loss there is a loss to life itself right and and suicide of course would be an attack on incarnation in the most literal sense. I'm thinking that we haven't talked about the effect of suicide on survivors, but I'm sure that's something that we've all had experience with. One of the most dangerous effects I have to say is that we know statistically that someone is at more risk of suicide if they have had a relationship with somebody who has suicided that it creates a sense of capacity to take that action if it has been demonstrated closely to us. So in that way, it can have a kind of infective power. Yes, I think absolutely it can uh, reinforce uh, negative and simply unrealistic beliefs. Uh, if you've had that, in a sense, modeled for you. As a way to solve a problem. Exactly. Well, and there's also, as, as you referenced, Joseph, we know that suicide is one of the endless <laughs> numbers of human behaviors that can be contagious. And suicide contagion is something that we've known about uh, for a long time and has been studied and, and written about. What I'm uh, back on is the effect on friends and family who are left behind. That is uh, heavy and it is hard. Uh, it's, it's the most difficult thing I think we have to bear. It doesn't get much worse than that. I, it really does not. And what I have been privy to is the remonstrations of the survivors who tend often to think that they could have or they would have or they should have or if only, as if that was really <laughs> something that they could have controlled. And sometimes it's true. There, We always wish we had had more wisdom than we did in the moment. But I'm aware that that tendency to take it on and to blame uh, or to feel guilty about uh, the loss of life is really um, not the case most of the time. This was an other person who had his or her, her other issues and made a choice. And although in a way it can be comforting to think we might have had control over it, uh, sometimes really awful 
things happen. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to accept. It's hard to accept and it's hard to simply mourn. It is. And, and I mean, I think there can also be a lot of anger at the person. And maybe that feels really unacceptable in the midst of your grief to also feel terrible anger at the person. So that can be a hidden feeling that's knocking around in there that we have to try to make room for. I'm also thinking that there can be such a difficult space for survivors in trying to understand why. And sometimes we may really know why we've watched the person suffer for a long time, or perhaps they left a really comprehensive letter or something, and there's some story we can cling to. But oftentimes the nature of suicide itself is so uh, incomprehensible that there is no story that really makes it make sense. And then we have to bear not being able to make sense of it. Another way that that plays out similarly is that it just never feels closed. This kind of violent, unanticipated interruption in a life doesn't provide any images of decline, any process of preparation for letting go. It's as if the person has simply been removed from the narrative of the survivors um, and and as if they are continuing to pick up the thread to find where the person is in some fashion. And mm -hmm. that can go on for decades and decades. Mm -hmm. It's if you've read halfway through the book and all of a sudden a chapter is missing and you, and you simply can't keep, can't continue the narrative until the chapter is written. So being suspended mm -hmm. in that shock and horror and constantly repeating the grief over and over and over again. Kind of Sisyphusian despair can rise up in the parents, for instance, of those who've lost a child. This is a kind of loss and a kind of sadness uh, that is incredibly hard to bear. I think for me, part of it is letting go of the sense that a parent or a roommate or, you know, some other friend that somehow you could have done something that you bore some responsibility for. You did not. Uh, we all have our failings, but no one uh, has caused this person to make such a grievous decision when that person was cared about however imperfectly, because we are imperfect and we don't have prescience and um, some kind of saintly wisdom, but we're there. Uh, to let go of that and then perhaps to create, uh, in addition to whatever the memorial and funeral rites are, but uh, later on to have a ritual uh, perhaps with some help from a religious counselor, a wise friend, uh, a therapist, of saying your own goodbye. Certainly the loss will always be there. There will always be an absence. Uh, and I want to say to those survivors, you have your lives still ahead, still to live, and there is an awful and hard way in which we can deepen and know more of ourselves and more about life and offer ourselves in different ways uh, to those who are still living as we are. Hi. This is Deb from this Jungian Life podcast. Joseph, Lisa, and I have been deeply moved by your response to our work, but producing, editing, and distributing it involves substantial expenses, and now we need your help. Please stop by our website, thisjungianlife.com, and click on the heading, Be Our Patron. You'll be redirected to our Patreon funding page. Patreon helps creators connect with people who believe in projects like ours. 
There, you can sign up with your credit card to support us for as little as a dollar a month. And at higher levels of support, we'll provide special episodes, behind-the-scenes photos and stories, and a chance to join a select pool of listeners for dream interpretations. Once again, please go to this Jungianlife.com and click on Be Our Patron. Thank you. Our dreamer is a 29-year-old female who works as a mental health professional. And here's the dream. I see a baby approximately a month old. It is my baby, and it has been crying a lot. I see that he is wet, so much so that his blanket is also wet. I'm in horror as I try to understand why he is so wet even with a diaper on. I wonder for how long did I not check on him. I change him. While doing that, his leg is so fragile that if I hold it, it twists. I panic. I look at my hands and they're shaking. I get scared and criticize myself and wonder if I would be able to take care of him. In the end, he has been changed and cleaned, and I'm holding him in my arms. It's peaceful now and I feel much better. She adds a bit of context. This dream came on the night of her therapy where she had been talking about not having a strong sense of self. In the dream, she writes that she was shocked, scared, and helpless. And she adds that the baby she saw in the dream was her sister's child, but in the dream, it seemed like it was hers. Well, I think one place that we can start with this dream is by looking at the archetype of the child, which is something that Jung wrote a whole essay about, and he referenced it many times. So, you know, babies and dreams are not that unusual, and they often resent, represent a new content, a new attitude, a new creative impulse, something new that's coming into consciousness. And I always think it's interesting to ask the person, so this baby's about a month old, so if I had this person in my office, I'd say, well, what happened about a month ago? or sometimes even what happened 10 months ago, you know, what got conceived 10 months ago, what was birthed a month ago. Sometimes you can find a correlation. Oh, that's when I started planning on taking this new class or something like that. So sometimes you can actually say, okay, well, the baby is represents this new endeavor, this new impulse. But archetypally, you know, the child archetype represents something that is full of promise that is full of a sense of the future, but it's also always very vulnerable. And here's just a quick quote from Jung, which I really like, which lifts this up. He says, in every adult there lurks a child, an eternal child, something that is always becoming, is never completed, and calls for unceasing care, attention, and education. That is the part of the personality which wants to develop and become whole. This seems particularly moving on the tail of what we were just talking about, suicidality. That often in the archetype of suicidality, which by the way, the dreamer has not said she's suffering with, but in the archetype of suicidality, there is often a birth, death, and resurrection cycle that is hinted at archetypally. So it seems synchronistic that we would be following that descent into the stream where new life is appearing in this woman and she's negotiating with how to care for that in herself. I am really struck by um, all the references and intensity around urine and, and liquid. First of all, the baby's been crying a lot and a month old baby may not yet make tears, but that's at least um, implicit in crying. And then he is wet, so much so his blanket is also wet. I'm in horror as I try to understand why he's so wet, even with the diaper on. So it really calls up what, what are we talking about with 
with urine, this liquid that we that we all produce that has a lot of um, sort of medicinal and uh, sort of sacred qualities of being used for snake bite and healing wounds and anointing kings. On the other hand, this is wet and cold and old, and I wonder if it also goes to um, the emotional state, a, a kind of uh, sadness, wetness, coldness, something that might have been unattended, uh, something personal, and certainly something that is not being well contained, uh, well held. Although fortunately, at the, at the end of the dream, uh, all is well, and it's peaceful. But uh, where is that cold, wet, sodden quality in her? Well, and this sort of surfeit of wetness, I wonder a little bit about just emotionality. And Deb, I really like uh, what you said about it being uncontained. Something definitely here is uncontained. But and, you know, if you have ever taken care of a baby, um, a baby being really wet, it's not good, but it's not the end of the world. And horror seems like such an overreaction to realizing that the baby hasn't been attended to. So, by the way, we would say that the ego becomes aware, the dream ego becomes aware that some tender, vulnerable inner part of herself, some new life, hasn't been well tended to. But when we really look at it, uh, yeah, there's there's been an oversight here, but it's not it's not dramatic. No one's in danger. She there's a sense of panic. She feels, the dream ego feels like she won't be capable of taking care of this baby. But I think it, you know, actually she is. And, and we see that at the end of the dream. It, it's, it's poignant because I think this dream actually mirrors what oh. a lot of mothers, maybe fathers too, feel when you, when you first um, bring home a new baby. It's mm -hmm. like, oh my God, I'm going to break it. You know, <laughs> I remember, um, a few weeks after my daughter was born, I, I used this kind of topical cream because my, my shoulders were, <laughs> my shoulders were all tense because I've been trying to nurse. And I, so I put this kind of uh, topical cream on it. And then I discovered there was aspirin in the top topical cream and, you know, babies can't have access to aspirin. And it was like, oh my God, did she, you know, did she imbibe some without me realizing it? And I, <laughs> I actually oh. called poison control. <laughs> <laughs> I was so distraught. And the, the woman was so nice. Aww. She she must have known exactly where I was. She was very, very comforting. But but you, you get that sense from the street. It's like, no, I'm going to twist the leg and, you know, the baby's wet, but the baby's fine, you know. So it's this very tender thing of the vulnerability of this new psychic life. But the dream is giving the dreamer some reassurance here that the, the baby's the baby's fine. And she's okay. She's going to be take, able to take care of this baby. You know, what, she, what came up for her in her therapy that she didn't have a strong sense of self. I think the dream is refuting that gently. Yeah. You have a stronger sense of self than you think you do, I think is what the dream is saying. And I think that the dream is saying that her fear is what kind of takes over to the extent that it affects uh, and gets confused with her real capability. She says, you know, I panic. Her hands are shaking. I get scared. And criticize myself. Yes. So, okay, that's what goes on in the internal world. But actually, in the external world, you're fine. You can do it. Uh, so that the feeling and your capability are two different things. They're not the same thing. So there seems to be a pattern of negative self-appraisal with this person because she does it in the dream. I criticize myself and say I won't be able to take care of the baby. And she did it that day at her therapy appointment where she said, I have a weak sense of self. Mm -hmm. So there seems to be just a pattern of kind of uh, negative self-appraisal that, that the dream is saying is not based in reality. I'm also thinking that if there is some assessment about a developing self, that one of the first stages of having an authentic sense of self is to have a very clear 
experience and relationship of our instincts. That really listening to the body, listening to the depths of what we need and learning how to respond to that is where we get a sense of who we are in our more sophisticated and adult ways. So if the therapy is working well, and it sounds like it is, something has been put in her hands that is highly instinctive and requires tending. And while the ego, the day-to-day consciousness may not be accustomed to taking care of those needs, it is more than capable of doing so, of learning how to do so. As we'd said before, with all of the urine that's flowing out of the child, that that can represent any number of things that is actually happening to her. Is she particularly uncontained? Perhaps she's oversharing. Perhaps her emotions or other psychological material are flowing excessively out into the environment and that part of the learning process in the dream is how to clean up some of that. Maybe she has to go back to a couple of relationships, maybe, and rein some stuff in, make a few repairs, kind of tighten things up a little bit, clean up her life a little bit. It's not a tragedy, just as you said, babies can be bathed and wiped off. It's no big deal, but it requires attention so that it doesn't become a big deal. And then the baby gets a rash and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> you know, um, I'm aware that there's a generational uh, factor here in that she ha- is in therapy. And it came on the night uh, when she had had her therapy. And I'm going back to your story, Lisa. And I, re- I could tell some more stories about when my babies were newborns that new mothers need mothering. And uh, so there is a sort of a a godmother, grandmother, uh, kind of a parental caring image here in the invisible person of the therapist who is, who's off stage, that may also really be a factor, just the timing of the dream of, of, she's now ready and able to take care of this new, very pissy baby in her own psyche. <laughs> yeah, I like, I like that. Um, I like that. I'm, I'm wondering if there's anything that we can say about her concern about the leg. I mean, that's, that's also a kind of um, specific symbolic moment that of all the things that she might be attending to, the dream maker um, holds focus on the leg. And so if I were to just riff about that, the baby will eventually need its legs to stand on its own. So perhaps it's some kind of a foreshadowing both about her own autonomy that's trying to be born, and again, her ego, ambivalence, or lack of confidence that she will have legs that are strong enough to stand on her own, that there's something fragile in her that may or may not be realistic, but is coming up in the dream. Do we have anything to say about the fact that it's the sister's baby, which then she suddenly thinks is her own? Well, uh, without knowing anything else about this dreamer or her sister or her relationship with her sister, I would say that sisters often turn up in dreams as shadow figures. And so it would be a sense that the uniting with the shadow in some way, finding a relationship with the shadow is fertile. It, it gives birth to offspring. That there's some way that um, it's the, the shadow part of her that is fecund. Mm-hmm. That's a very and, perspective. And that is often true. Yeah. yeah. I would also like to say that her, if her sister has recently given birth, I'm wondering if the dreamer is feeling fretful about the sister's capacity to care for her children. Is the unconscious, sometimes it just rings a very concrete bell. Check in with your sister. You know, is she okay? Does she need a little more support than your conscious mind is aware of? Um, and she, she might 
need you to show up a little bit. And sometimes the unconscious is just really pragmatic that way. Yeah, that's interesting, Joseph. And it makes me wonder, Deb, I'm sort of picking up on what you said before about the m- new mothers needing to be mothered and the position of the therapist. If I had to spin a story about this dreamer, I would imagine that there is a mother wound. Because often it's when we have a mother wound that we find ourselves in that real kind of self critical space where we're always doubting ourselves and putting ourselves down. And especially because this dream is around adequate care for the baby. When we have a mother wound, we may not step into motherhood feeling very confident. So Joseph, that is interesting. If there, if there was a mother wound in this family, how is the sister doing with the baby? Yeah. And, and is the dreamer here feeling just really unsure that she has anything to contribute to her sister in this realm? And, and the dream maker is suggesting you have more to contribute to your sister and her family than you might realize, and that your presence there could evoke a sense of peace and that you might feel better being a little more involved. So there's a, a really big theme here around nurturing, isn't there? Mm-hmm. And uh, the dream maker uh, points in all these various realms uh, to the dreamer's ability to give, to care, uh, and to achieve a sense of of peace. There's a real opportunity here. Peace is available. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, Help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.